uh this is podkick episode 20 don't even at me on sunday april 3rd 2016 and now the one true dale this episode of podkick is hosted by brandon johnson brian mitchell and ryan rampersad this show has episode notes wait the other thing this episode has show notes at thenexus.tv slash pk20 Hello, hey everybody. Hello. Welcome back. It's been, you know, a few weeks. I think it's been it's a been month. Time. It, yeah. it, you know, it's been exactly a month. It was March 3rd when we recorded last. What? Yeah. Well, at least we're consistent, right? Time huh. flies. Time flies. Well, we had a nice special in between that. That's we true. We talked about apple things. So it's it's really been only a few weeks then, in other words. That's true. That's true. It was, it was March 22nd when we had our... Apple special spring event 2016 Nexus special where we talked about what? Uh, lots Dude. of stuff. That's right. Don't forget the watch bands. Oh, I forgot totally oh, yeah. all about it. Did you ever order one, Brandon? I didn't, but I walked into the Apple store like three times and was like, oh, do you guys have the, I think they're calling it the royal blue and gold one, um, okay. the nylon watch band. And every time they were like, oh no, we're going to get them in tomorrow. And I was like, oh, you guys breaks my heart um it, it wasn't three days in a row for the record uh it was like uh a week and a half ago uh a week ago and two days ago do they sell and... apple watch stuff at the human apple store oh no uh i went to the uh the one at the dale of my choice the, okay the dale mall of my choice the one so. true dale the one true dale okay there's only one and it is the dale of roses yes that's, that is the best dale indeed uh, somebody, somebody on Twitter was making fun of me. They, they thought it was Southdale, but it wasn't, because there is only one Dale, and that is Rosedale. Was that, that is true. Oh, no, it was on Instagram. It was on Instagram, and it was friend of the show. Um, uh, I, I know his real name, which is difficult because he has a, a, another name on Twitter. Friend of the show. Um, those are, those accounts that have nothing to do with your name. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, what's that about? I'm uh, glad we don't have any of those anymore no. for reasons we're going to talk about well, shortly. Um, yeah, a couple of them are still existing, but <laughs> we're getting there. Anyhow, so there's stuff that's happening. Yes. One of the things that's happening uh, is that Ryan works at a place. I do work at a place now, suddenly, just out of the middle of nowhere. Tell so, us about this place that you work So at. I work at a place called Dowerty. Now, whether that's actually how they say it or not is not up to me. I still don't know how to officially say it. Different people say it differently. I have no idea. Interesting. Uh, but apparently, according to something I read in uh, my work Slack channel, uh, it's Dowerty as in party. But I don't really know if that makes sense, so you tell me. So, like, Dowerty? You mean, like, Darty, if it's, like, party? If that's really how they are supposed to say it, that's awful, and I refuse to be a part of it. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I work at uh, what they call Dowerty Business Solutions, and I'm an uh, associate consultant and or software engineer one. And uh, my first day was on the 28th, so last Monday. And nice. uh, this would be my second week tomorrow, so probably by the time you're hearing this. And uh, for the first week, I really didn't do too much. I, you know, did... did HR paperwork, and then I um, got my laptop set up, and I have my VM and the the code base for the project I'm assigned to. I can't really tell you too much about what the project does or how it works. It's some kind of pharmacy application, and the reason I can't really tell you about how it works or what it does is because I don't actually know, um, and not because of an NDA. Uh, the code base is fairly old, I can tell you that much. It's it's not uh, what they would call a modern code base, so working with it will be lots of fun, and I look forward to it. Nice, yeah. I'm looking through your your photos you have linked here, and it looks like a a good a good view on a couple stories up. So, totally. um, so, so I've got a story for that. So, uh, there's at, at a consulting place, I guess there's a thing called the bench and it's just not my company. It's a lot of companies, a lot of consulting firms have benches and that's where you go when you're not on, um, a client's work. So if you're in between different clients or, 
you know, for some reason you, you want to switch in, in between, I guess you'd be there. Well, right. I, was on, I think, yeah, go I ahead. think Casey List said a thing about this at one point. Yeah, on I'm sure he's either on the bench in the parking lot or on the client. I mean, it, it could right. be, could okay. be anything. So the bench is where all the little cubicles are in the office, and uh, that's where some of the nice views are. Actually, the best view is in the bench area. Now, that's where I was on the first day when I was just filling out my paperwork. But then on the second day, I was put into my new space, which is the kitchen. So three weeks ago, I guess it's four weeks ago now, when I interviewed for the second time, I had lunch with with the people in the office in what I thought would be the kitchen slash dining room. And it turns out, four weeks later, that actually became my office. <laughs> so nice. uh, at, at Dougherty right now, there's a, well, at Dougherty MSP anyway, there's 101 active consultants. And um, in the office, I think there's 34 people working on the same project I'm working on in various subgroups. And wow. um, we are bursting, apparently, uh, from from the original dev center to to another room, which used to be a conference room, and now to the kitchen. So we, we have no space. We are desperate. Yeah, it looks like one of the rooms there is definitely a conference room looking mm-hmm. thing. So if, if there's a really cool picture I put in that little album in that on that work page. And it's a uh, photosphere. So you can you can just scroll around and right. see my little yeah. office. Now if you look uh in that in that photosphere, you can see where all the cabinets are in the kitchen. My desk is the one closest to those cabinets in that picture. So uh, you can see where that is. Oh, wow. So it, that's pretty cool. Um, you know, I have a laptop. I have a monitor and a keyboard and a chair. Um, so, yeah. So I'm, I'm in a I'm, – I'm not sure exactly what team I'm in. I think I'm in the QA team or something. I'll tell you more next time I hear you guys gotcha. in the future. Because I don't really know. Um and so apparently I'm I started not with the rest of the group I guess. So when uh-huh. when when Dougherty went to the CSE science not science fair, my gosh, career fair. Yeah. Uh they picked out maybe, you know, 50 people. And then they interviewed those people. And then they called back 20 for the second interview. And then I think they probably called maybe 10 or so for the third interview. And because I was available now, early, instead of June, here I am. I started early. But that also okay. means I didn't. I don't have any training. Nobody's actually trained to me. I don't have any. I don't. I don't have anything. I don't know anything about anything. <clears throat> so it's kind of weird. Yeah. In my internship last summer, I started two and a half through we intern who I was working with, mm-hmm. but she had actually interned at the same company the summer before. But we weren't on the same page in terms of the project, so right. I had to her up, but I got they waited for something, so it was kind of awkward mm-hmm. in the meantime. Yep. So that that's what <laughs> I'm doing. Um, so my project is primarily in Java, and um, one of the interesting things about it is that it uses GWT. Do you, do either of you know about GWT? No, no I I didn't. It, it's the uh, Bader Meinhof effect, right? So once you t- once you and I and Brian were talking about it uh, online. I started looking at an app that I was working on and noticed that it used uh, GWT as well. Mm-hmm. I uh, mm. it, it wasn't it's not one that I'm writing code for, but it's one that I am uh, analyzing, shall we say? Yeah. So GWT for our listeners is the Google Web f- what toolkit? I toolkit? think. Yeah. Yeah. All and, right. Okay, that sounds familiar. And now, bear with me. Now, let's go back to when you were in like maybe elementary school, maybe middle school. This is when Gmail was just coming out, and this is when Google decided to open source the method to make their web app. So Calendar, Gmail, Blogger, Spot, whatever. GWT was probably what was backing a lot of those products. GWT is written in Java, and what it does is it's sort of like a... It's not really in VC, but it's sort of like that. And you get a server side and a web and a client side portion, and the entire client side is literally and physically generated with Java, with just Java. And then it compiles that Java into JavaScript, and then it runs and ma- builds not only functionality but the entire UI. Oh no! Now you think to yourself, "Well, that's cool. One language to rule them all. Run right once. Run everywhere." But here's the problem: that sucks. 
<laughs> it's like the inverse of Node.js, it feels like. So, <laughs> I mean, I guess I grew up in a different time. I, I mean, I, I didn't, I mean, I've, I've done web stuff for years. You know, back then I hated GWT because ugh, it's Java. <laughs> who, yeah. who likes that? But, but now, you know, we have so much better tooling and we have such a, a much, a much, a big, a big, much broader tool set of what we can do in terms of language support on the client side and enhancements on the, on, on the server side for all of this stuff. So if we want to have functionality on the server that, that comes through a REST API, and then we have right. tons of stuff doing that on the back end. If we want to do stuff on the client side, you know, we have, of course, Angular, we have React, we have Vue, you know, t countless, an absurd amount of options. You know, GWT does not have a place in my world anymore. So, yeah. Now, on the other no. hand, it also uses Spring. Now, the Spring is pretty cool. It's sort spring. of, it's sort of the actual MVC style. So, Spring, you know, can do the database stuff. It can do, run a controller. It can run, um, it could sort of run a view, but that's kind of handed off to the GWT in this case. So there, there oh is, really? Yeah, because GWT renders all of the stuff, sort of. It's very, right. it it's very convoluted in this particular case. Because they're using so, sort of two methods. Right. It uses both Spring and GWT. Uh-huh. Oh, wow. So for the data layer, it's it's probably more Spring. And then for the front-end type stuff, it's all GWT because that's like the, right. the main selling point. Yeah, so the, so the service business logic is primarily kept within Spring. However... Right. Uh, due to poor decisions between now and whenever it was made, there is quite a bit of leakage between the service application layer and the actual functional user facing layer. Oh wow. So you know mm. you know, in all projects that involve heavy amounts of UI, which is all of them these days, you don't yeah. really get to run away from the fact that there might be data about states in the UI going back up to the server. I mean you just sort of have to do it at some point. Right. And unfortunately, that that extra data doesn't get kept to the first layer that goes up to the server. You know, if there's one layer on the server that has this issue, that's fine. That's you can live with it. But when all the layers are permeated with client side knowledge, it's kind of weird. And then, of course, you say, "Well, surely the client side does not have server side logic embedded all over it." Well, let <laughs> me tell you, it certainly does. <laughs> And it's not that anybody did it wrong. It's just that the tools didn't help you fix it. Right. So when I write in Laravel, which is my PHP framework of choice, you know, there's a model, there's a controller, and there's a view. And you don't have to do any of that if you don't want to, but it's very hard to break out of that. Right. So it helps you. Now, Vue.js is a great tool because it really forces you to keep your data in one place, in one method one pattern and practice there's not right. all this breaking out and frivolity definitely definitely that's one of the things that i found i really like about ruby on rails uh the trick is that sometimes ruby on rails one of the fa failings i've seen with it isn't necessarily a failing of that but perhaps of the things i'm trying to build ruby on rails apps around is that sometimes the processes that you're that you are trying to make a web app for don't cleanly fit with the separation of concerns that is so you have to separate the concerns in the business process before you separate the concerns in uh the app itself yep <laughs> and, th and that's a thing that's really hard to do now so of course i'm an se one and i have no clue what i'm talking about right now on the other hand i don't know if a lot of my other se one um what do, what do you call those people? Colleagues? Colleagues, coworkers? Yes, those people. I don't know what that's their experiences right. are. Now, I, I do web stuff. That's that's all I know, and I do it well. Uh -huh. I, I have, I've never written an official thing. I mean, you know, in terms of like an API with a client-side consuming front end. But I know how to do it, and I can see how it would work. And I've done enough on the server side to know how that part would work. So I feel like if we tried to pivot over to that, it would be... Wonderful, but then we would be AFK for six months and our client would hate us. Right. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So that I consulting. will tell you all about this again in like another month when we record again. And, <laughs> right. um, you know, we'll see where we go. So apparently the software is at 
or they're going to release 5.1.0 soon. So they're at the they're kind of like in a uh, code freeze, I think. Uh-huh. So I'm not really doing much, and I probably won't do much for another week or so. But then after that, I'll probably do stuff, and then I will know more and could nice cry with you. <laughs> no, no, gotcha. Well, I'm glad to hear that you're having fun. And yeah, you know, I, it's pretty cool. Even it's even though it, that kind of stuff can sometimes get a little strange. It's you know, it's good to hear that you're it's a it. it's a you know it's a big jump from going to school every day. You know, you you go to work every day instead. And then, you know, it's also a big jump from going to my old high school to teach lame community education classes. You know, it's it's actual work, but it's still not work work. You know, you know, it's it's like work one point five. How about that? uh, (laughs) Well, once you start writing some code, it'll. (laughs) Yeah, then it'll be work one point three five. Well, actually, I, I did write some code already, so. Um, oh, yeah. I was watching my 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 um, mentor coworker do some stuff, and so he had to test a change he made. And for some reason or another, you you have to. Um, so I guess the idea is when you have a pharmacy order, you have to get it approved by different people or in different departments or something. Right. Um, and so you have to send it, the order from your tray to the other person's tray. And then you uh-huh. just hit you hit the send button. Well, the send button is something you had to fix because there was some bug or something. So then he had to go and test it. So what he has to do is he in the test database he you know has a bunch of different user accounts. So you know the the admin and the the pharmacist and then the QA person and then the, some other person. And he had to send it from user account to user account. And what I noticed is he had to type in the username and password and client site name every single time. So what I did is I built a little bookmarklet. So you can generate the bookmarklet yep. with all those things filled out, drag it to your bookmarks bar, and it'll fill it in whenever you need it to. <laughs> nice. I'm high-fiving you right now because <laughs> that is exactly what I did this week when I was migrating a bunch of uh, content from Google Docs to uh, to our, our CMS. Yep. And in order to do so, now granted, I, I don't work on the team that made this content. I work on the team that manages the cms mm-hmm. um so i fully understand why these fields have to be there and i am not like some people who get really angry at the cms for having these things i know why these things have to be there and it's oh, yeah. because we have like 37 teams mm-hmm. but as a result i have a whole template for uh uh for a bookmarklet that fills in this stuff for me and all i have to do in order to make it work is change some variables at the top and then it It'll fill out the rest of the form. See, uh, form fields as needed. See, you're doing it right. Is, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I don't, I don't. So we don't really have. I don't know what the like open source policy is yet. But right. you know, like all the code I write is open source in my mor- my mind. Um, but we'll see. I mean, it's just a bookmark. Lad. You can imagine how it works. Query selector yeah. all. Best thing <laughs> yep, ever. That's, that's literally what mine is. But the trick is, our some of our uh, our admin UIs. Um, uh, div IDs or um, s- the selectors for the uh, for the form fields mm-hmm. are uh, super arcane, um, which is just an artifact of the way that those fields are generated from yep. the database. They mm-hmm. use the database name, uh, or I-, I guess I don't know necessarily if they do that because all that's abstracted. Hat separation of concerns. Right oh, back at it. hey, but um, you know what? We don't have that even. We have Hibernate <laughs> and Spring raw queries. Oh. So, so they're intermixed. See, oh, yeah. Use... Oh, yeah. Because <laughs> I've, I've, I've used Hibernate before, but I. Eh, uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. But maybe that's better left unsaid. Um, <laughs> but, uh, okay, so I don't even remember where I was. Where did I go? I'm full on John Gruber mode tonight, guys. Oh, don't, don't about... worry about it. I'm, I am too. Um, but we were talking about. I think we're talking uh, about. Uh, I think we're talking about Brian's experiences with Puppet. That but first, sounds more like. But it. first, we have some follow up from. How? Ian Arba. Where? How did this follow up come to exist? From March eighth at four twenty one p.m. Oh, that's amazing! It's, it's in my drunk folder because that's where the Nexus feedback goes. Um, <laughs> uh, he says, "Quoting: Can I airdrop links to myself when I was saying that?" And he says, "A perfect scenario where a push bullet would have been useful." That may be true, Ian, but. I don't have to send links very often. And we tried push bullet one time on podkit and suffice it I to say that on podkit, we use push. So. 
We uh, used it for I, about 10 minutes and then we all quit. I, I did yeah. not quit. I use it all the time, but. I'm, I'm going to throw in a Mean Girls reference here and say, on PodKit, we use AirDrop. Yeah. We're, we're a little more Apple-y. Although AirDrop should be able to send links. I think that would be nice. But so, I guess the way you send a link is you open it in Safari on your phone and then you go to your computer and you click the just the Safari icon saying open page from your phone or you go to your your open tabs on other on other devices and you just open that tab. Right. So, Admittedly I'm fully trained to do that right now. Like that's that's what uh I'm I'm one part of Johnny Ive's little aluminum uh aluminum world, cage yes. of the life. Yeah, exactly, right? Uh-huh. That's that's the thing that I'm trained to do. Yeah, and I it just took me a second because I don't do it very often. I just wish I saw a tweet about this earlier today, but I just wish every app would use Safari View Controller rather than Web Views. That would just make my life so much easier. Not necessarily easier, but I would appreciate that. Um, Ian also said, "Yeah, Ryan, you should totally teach. I envision you as an eccentric college professor, a little bit of Nick McPhee." Brian will know what I'm talking about. So he's a professor at Morris. Yeah, I know Nick McPhee also. Okay. Yeah. I follow him on the Twitter. Uh, Yeah. I like teaching. I'm a big fan of that. Um, I would not be surprised if I uh, wind up in a uh, training or education role where I work too. Yeah. So we'll see about that. Uh, It's pretty, uh, pretty, pretty cool. I do a lot of, um, well, in the week I've been there, I've taught the guy next to me all about how to use the shell and the terminal better and and stuff. So, yeah. So, I'll talk a little bit about what I've been doing in my free time instead of doing classes or my senior seminar in the last month and a half. So we use a tool called Puppet in the computer science labs. And by we, I mean the lab administrators, which I'm technically not a lab administrator this school year, but I still know the password and still help out. So Puppet is, um, let's see what the Puppet website describes itself as. Let's see. IT automation Labs. software system administrators. I mean, I hope that's the Puppet website. I mean, I have no idea. It is. It is. Good. Um, so if I click learn more, it gives me a slightly better description, which is that uh, Puppet Enterprise makes it easy to automate the provisioning, configuration, and ongoing management of your machines and the software running on them. Yeah. So we are using the um, community-supported version, so the free version in the lab. And... Um, Basically, version 4.0 came out at some point in the last year or two, which broke everything in our lab. So the basically, the clients were being updated while the server was not. So our server, the old server, is running Fedora 18, where the lab is currently at 22. And everything broke when we went to Fedora 20. So it's been broken for a good year and a half. So basically, um, our puppet specifies a bunch of packages to have installed, so GCC, um, I don't know, get screen, I just added VLC, so Eclipse and Atom and, you know, all your standard stuff you want on every box. And so that was broken. And part of in there is a little uh, module we call perma update, which basically just runs, uh, this is pr- not the good way to do it, but it runs DNF dash dash assume yes upgrade. Yay. So just forcibly every four hours upgrades everything on the box. Oh, that's so, amazing. So we are always up to date when Puppet is working, which is nice. And um, generally things don't break, so that's good. Um, so basically I started off, I took a box that wasn't currently working, put SendUS 7 on it, uh, went through and installed Puppet Server, which they call the Puppet Master, and the clients are the Puppet Agents. I think that is... Reference to some anime, the whole puppet name. Not sure, though. I can't think of it. I don't know. One of the computer science professors here was telling me about that, but I don't remember. Anyway, so I set that up, um, copied over every module from the old server, tested it. The old server, if you had, if you would run it, you, you could uh, one-time run it. It just wouldn't work very well in the as a system service. Um, it would be full of red and errors and warnings. And this now it's all green and happy. So it Yay. works. I deployed it to the se- the half of the lab that gets used a little more this afternoon at 5, and it all worked well. There were two issues, one with Ruby Gems and our 
the good old solution was to uninstall all gems and then we ran Puppet again and it was all fine. Uh, and uh, Node.js had some issues and we fixed it by DNF remove Node.js star and then ran Puppet again and it was fine. So all is well. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. I have to say, like um, the two largest struggles that I've ever seen people have uh, in provisioning their own machines uh, or provisioning machines for other people uh, are with those two environments, Node or Ruby, which is hilarious because I love both of these and I've only ever had trouble with Ruby, but um, that's because I learned to do it the Node way. And <laughs> um, But that's so cool that you guys have uh, set up automated configuration for those things. That's really valuable. And I know uh, it's the talk of other folks who run labs uh, they really like that too. So you guys are ahead of the curve on that. It's pretty darn neat. We desperately yeah, need it, something like that at work. It works. It works very well. Um, you know, so I guess for provisioning, there's basically a ensure this is installed a in machine and they're kind of individual still, or, you know, you have don't allow anyone to do anything and we're just going to put an image on it periodically. But that, that is less than ideal in my, in my opinion. Right. So does um does the puppet run on the machine itself or does it just SSH in or something like that? Uh, I don't know what it does underneath. I think maybe some Samba stuff, but okay. I'm not sure. That'd be interesting. No, I don't know. think so. Um, I know we have to sign a SSL certificate or okay. a TLS certificate mm-hmm. between uh, when you set up a new client and you have to have a list on the server of every node or mm-hmm. client server or client machine and they just they just ping this account file that says four hours mm-hmm. to just ask the master, hey, what's new? And the master says, here you go. Right. And it does stuff. And so it, it works quite well, and it was really not too hard to set up. Oh, I've considered good. even doing it for my own Macs because it does work on OS X. However, uh-huh. not having a full package manager is less than ideal. So you can install things, but you can't necessarily update them or remove them in the same way. Right. Hmm. But it works well. You can, you know, just copy over a, a tarball, extract it to a certain location, and ensure file file permissions, um, start and stop services, um, packages, of course. And then there's another feature of Puppet called Factor, which gives a ton of uh, system information about the client, and so you can use that to, uh, I guess, tweak what is going to go on the client. So if it's running different OS versions or different users are logged in or uptime or whatever's installed, you name it. Right. Neat. That's awesome. That's exactly the sort of thing that you want for, yeah, for managing labs and stuff like that. Well, Brian, I think uh, you've got some other news to share with us. You have come over to the dark side and uh, you're using Z shell, right? I am. Yeah. Um, Basically, watching Ryan's live coding stream from a week and a half ago. <laughs> That's so I funny. I saw him using Gmail, and I was like, hmm, I should try it out. So then I, I did, and I almost immediately installed Oh My Z Shell because I've, I've heard about that, and I didn't feel like configuring my own thing. So I did that. I put some plugins on. I used the default theme. I edited my terminal theme. Um... And I made a dot .files repository on GitHub. So nice. So I'll link to the show notes. So, do. yeah, I've just been tinkering around with copying files. So I did not make the repository in my home directory. The purpose of your home folder. I don't know. Where do you put your dot .files repository, Brandon? That is a good question. It depends on the machine, which is a horrible thing to say. Um, there's one machine where I do it right, which is, I believe what you're describing, uh, which is where you put the dot files in your like working folder. So the, the actual folder itself, the, the repository itself in your, like, uh, uh, like I've got one that's like documents slash repos. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, uh, I just use symlinks to point to the, uh, files. That way I can pull the repo and update the dot files at the same time. Ooh, I should do that. However, on another machine, I was lazy and I actually, I believe it's this machine right now that I'm using. Um, and I just copied the dot files into, uh, so I just uh, cloned the repo into 
my home folder. And every time something updates, I just select all in the .files folder and drag it out to <laughs> my home directory. It's uh, fine. Call it good. It's not a problem. That's more or less <laughs> what I do. I have a my .files is in documents.files. So I just CP every single file that changes, which is tedious. And I should probably symlink it and just call it good. Yeah, I, I heard that from somebody on Twitter who does it that way, and they're probably they're probably doing it right. But on on this, I think by the time I got to this computer on that project, I was a little bit burned out on it, so I was just like, oh, whatever, just make sure they're on here. <laughs> yeah. So like, so you're 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 talking about the dot files that you have up on the GitHub, right? That is correct. So, how would you? How would you store like so? I have in my uh, on my on the MacBook Air, I have a bunch of uh, functions that help me SSH into all my servers, right? And so, like, I don't want those functions to be willy nilly accessible to everybody, but it'd still be cool to have them in some kind of repository. So, how would you accommodate that? Right. So, keys and stuff, you could replace it with uh, environmental variables and keep that not committed, mm -hmm. or you make your repository private, but you know, that costs money in GitHub. Well, who uses See. GitHub anymore? <laughs> so what I do, uh, and this is probably not terribly popular, but I actually, so, so t two things. The first one being, I, I don't necessarily have this problem because I just don't share any dot files that have anything important in them in my dot files repo. Mm -hmm. Um, or at least I don't believe I do. I should probably check that at some point. Uh, but uh, if I did, one thing that I've done before when I want to maintain multiple versions of a versioned project where one has, say, private info and the other one doesn't, right? So one has like passwords or environment variables baked right. in, so it's easy to push to Heroku mm -hmm. uh, or something like that. Well, in that case, um, I will actually push one copy of it up to my private Git server that I run in a, on a VPS. See, that's doing uh, it right. And then the other one I okay. push publicly to GitHub. See, that's the answer I was looking for. What I I'm, do for... Or mm -hmm. finish. You finish. No, I was just going to say, uh, with the advent of my Docker VPS, my dedicated Docker VPS, it's like super simple. And I can even just spin up a container that's sole purpose is to be the Git server for a particular project. And I love it. <laughs> what I do for Weatherbot is... I have a keys.py file, which is in my gitignore. And so the version on GitHub is just all the things that I have set on my own machine, but replaced with a bunch of Xs. And so I just have to, whenever I change a function in keys.py, because I have all my functions for setting them as environmental variables. So I can use given ones or environmental variables. If no environmental variable is set, it tries to use ones from the file. So then it's easier for me to test and deploy to Heroku and things. So that seems pretty that good. I basically put in another change list and get, and don't commit any of that ever. And then they said, I don't think I am. No one got an ask. I've only committed my keys maybe three times, which I promptly realized and then changed them. So that's what I've done for that. I have not committed any keys or crimes. I am innocent. It's good, good record to have. Yeah, good one. So I just checked through mine, and no, I don't have any keys in there. Thank goodness. Um, it's just a fun little uh, Vim and uh, kind of Tmux and related dot files there. I also have my Z shell theme, which I made specifically for myself by copying the... Um, uh, I don't even remember which one. It was like the Yo Z shell theme, I think. Yo. I could be wrong. Yes, I yeah. know. Going back to you. Um, and I just changed one letter, and now it's the no Z shell theme. Oh. Uh, all I did, and this is so silly, is I replaced something I didn't want to see in my in my terminal prompt. I don't even remember what it was now. Um, but I replaced it with uh, um, the machine vendor, right? Which is, seems like such a oh, silly right. thing to yeah, say. Yeah, you right? mentioned that, actually. Yeah, yeah, but it's really helpful. Mm -hmm. So, like, if I'm SSHing into a machine, I can not only see the host name of the machine, but if I'm like, oh, crap, you know, because what will happen is my Docker instances will have gibberish for all of it. But if I, if I want to know whether I'm running Red Hat or Debian, 
it's really easy because it'll say Red Hat if it's Red Hat or Fedora if it's Fedora yep. or, uh, of all things, PC if it's Debian, which is annoying, but that's fine. Yeah, you uh, know those say, people. It will say Ubuntu if you are using Ubuntu, though, but um, this machine is not using Ubuntu, so it just says PC. I even tried overriding it in my local... Um, uh, the shell configuration, right? So I tried uh, overriding the environment variable, but it does not, it doesn't change a darn thing. It still says PC, so I must not be doing it right. But I don't care that much. So th- there's there's my Z shell theme. It's pretty neat and I like it. <laughs> I'm going to download it and try it out. Do it. It's a party. It is a two line Z shell oh. theme. I know some people don't like that, but I do. Well, I will download it and see how it works. Yeah, let me know what you think. I can file from GitHub and curl it into my folder, right? <laughs> yep. Curl it to, yeah, curl it wasn't, to... Wasn't uh, John shell, Syracuse right? just talking about how dangerous it is to curl things down into your machine and execute it? Yeah, yeah. If you're <laughs> curling it over HTTPS, you're fine. Oh, oh, sure, yeah, okay. And then, then your only issue is, do you trust your network? Do you trust the people who wrote the code that you haven't audited before you're running it absolutely I totally think. trusted <laughs> yeah i mean it, it depends i i tend to err on the side of if it's over https then uh if i want to install it i'm installing it like a that just as just as well as i would be installing anything else but i know some people are not of that mind which is fine it's totally fine anyhow uh, windows now you can pipe you can do the the curl through stuff you know, no, we, because bash on windows is that in our show oh, notes? Right. uh it totally is in our show notes i don't know what you possibly could be talking about well incidentally build 2016 was this week and i don't know about you but unlike wwdc and google io i didn't know that it even it was this week well last week i guess <laughs> So yeah. I don't know I don't know what the deal is with their marketing or advertising or messaging teams. I I don't understand. Like they did nothing to to advertise well. Like you know on the verge they say what do we expect at Google I/O this week? What's coming up at WWDC? New hardware, new iPhones, and there was just silence from Bill. Yeah, I heard absolutely nothing. So what we did get from Bill this week, well last week, whatever. Well, we got some HoloLens stuff. We got some new uh, Windows features. Cortana doesn't require to log in. Um, we have a new big build of Windows coming out in the summer. It's called the Anniversary Update. That's a terrible name. They could have literally named it anything with actual words, and it would have been better. But no, just some arbitrary anniversary update. I don't even know what it's the anniversary of. But... We did get one thing that will change the world as we know it. It is Bash on Windows. <gasps> what? And not just Bash too. It's like uh, a an Ubuntu subsystem, basically. The entire the user, it, right? are the, the the oh gosh, what was the, the phrase? Like users, yeah, the user land, right? So yep. So what that means to me is that they've found some way to uh, allow. Uh, Unix style system calls to hook into whatever massive silliness is uh, is uh, the Windows analog to the Linux kernel. You can tell where I sit on this uh, on the platform divide. Eh? <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, but you know, I, I mean, I sit on the other side, but I don't blame you because understanding how the Windows side works is impossible. No textbook wants to tell you. It makes no sense to me. So but that's fine. This is really impressive. So not only are we going to get full bash, so you know you you can do all your bash stuff. You can even switch to ZSH if you want. What? But not only that, we're also getting full app to get two. So you can also get whatever packages you want from the Ubuntu. Now it's not clear yet at this very moment how new or how fresh those packages will be. I wouldn't be surprised if they keep parity with whatever LTE whatever LTS release there is. That seems like a good time frame for updates. Um, this is a really interesting strategic move for Microsoft because uh, Microsoft up till now has sort of shunned the Linux community and kind of like, if you're not using Windows, you're doing it wrong and there's no other choice. Um, but of course, you know, they're, they're, they've, they've open sourced tons of .NET stuff. They've uh, either made it free or super duper cheap for Visual Studio 
they've open sourced or made really super duper dirt cheap for Xbox development. They've made a huge stride in this field. And this bash on Windows thing is incredible. I'm quite excited to use it. I will, if I have to use Windows at work in the future with bash or with, sorry, with uh, Ubuntu on Windows, I will be so much happier. So there are still some remaining questions. So as far as I can tell, it only has bash on Windows for Windows 10 with the anniversary update. So at work, I use Windows 7, so I'm screwed. Hmm. So unless you're for working now, well, for yeah, now, it'll upgrade soon enough. yeah, cause it'll auto upgrade itself. Right. So uh, <laughs> assuming, I mean, if my work for some reason suddenly has, um, you know, some amazing prompt to, to upgrade, I would have this ability later this summer. That'd be cool, but I probably won't ever get this while I'm working there. Like windows seven is going to be with us until 2025 and we know it. We're going to have to live through it. Really? Probably. It's going to be the new Windows that's, XP, you know? That's so strange to me because, like, we're at uh, we're already upgrading people to uh, Windows 10. Um, well, see, you're in a progressive community full of, you know, happy people, full of pride uh, and joy. I feel, uh, like, I feel like large institutions, like schools and things that have a lot of networked accounts where you don't have very much money, it's a lot easier to upgrade. So if everything's remotely managed on the other hand our business which is a bunch of programmers sitting in a room with free coke in the fridge we can handle it i know how to install windows just let me do it but no do they not let you no there are rules apparently hmm. <laughs> rules well, oh, those were... yeah so that's really cool i will we will have to talk about this again when we can do it later or when we get more information because this is impressive absolutely Absolutely. Well, I've got a couple of things that uh, I want to chat about here, kind of towards the end of this uh, show. The first one being Night Shift. Night Shift being the Apple's, shall we say, Sherlocked uh, version of Flux, which is the popular utility to change the uh, hue of uh, your screen. So, like on my MacBook, I use Flux to make my color screen very yellow. Yeah, color temperature. Thank you. Um, so it, it makes the screen a little bit more orange and a little bit less blue. And that's supposed to make it easier to uh, easier to kind of work with, certainly late at night, or um, to not kind of disrupt your sleep cycles is ostensibly what the research seems to indicate. Unless like you're you John Gruber, in which people. case it doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, I like my screen the way it is. That's Burning what he said. Like, that was perfect. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, you know, I was really impressed to see that Apple included this in their, in their, uh, what was it, 9.3? Is that what it was? Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I, I, I never would have seen it coming. I remember the outcry from the community when they kind of kicked whatever it was. Their iOS app out? Yeah. Yeah, their iOS app. I remember, I remember that too. I was, I was pretty upset with that because, uh, I remember asking Brian to send me the source code, which he did very kindly. And I compiled and ran it on my yeah. phone for quite some time. Mm -hmm. uh, I had it for months. Yeah. Until the 9.3 beta came out. Right. Right. It was awesome. And I remember seeing that. And I was just like, Oh, this is so much better because it doesn't, uh, turn on my phone every 10 minutes. Uh, yeah. But, oh, so much better. Yeah. It, and, uh, believe it or not, there's actually one instance of this that I really appreciated yesterday. Um, uh, that I appreciate this whole technology, whether it's on my iPad or on my Mac. I was designing an invitation for uh, a graduation party um, for a family member. And um, in order to use InDesign and Illustrator, as you all know, you need to have uh, Flux turned off or Night Shift turned off. Because if you don't, you get some really weird color combos that start to make no sense. Yes. Um, like uh, certain early iterations of a certain show logo here on the Nexus. Oops. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh neither here nor there but there uh so last night i was doing that and of course when i when i turn that on you know my my phone has night shift on my ipad has night shift on um my mac has flux on but then i turn on indesign and all of a sudden i can feel my eyes slowly disintegrating in the face of this blue light and i'm like man i really wish i weren't doing uh, graphic design at 10 yep. p.m. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so this 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 thing is really awesome. And if you haven't upgraded to 9.3 yet, for a myriad of other reasons, uh, especially this one for me right now, 9.3.1 now. Do it, yeah, 9.3.1. You got to do it. 
So I, I can tell you uh, two interesting things. So on Android N, which is the next version of Android, there's a mm-hmm. similar feature. I think it's called just Night Mode. And uh-huh. it has some features where it can uh, automatically turn it on for you at a certain predetermined time, so whenever sunset right. is. Or you can just have it turn on at the same time every night. Or you can just have it a toggle switch in your drop-down menu thing. So that's pretty cool. Right. Android N. It's coming soon. Bye now. And I'll tell you another cool story. So when I was developing the Android app for my class way back when in, in college for uh-huh. uh, 5115 user interface design, I was running an app called Twilight. And um, it was similar to to all the apps that, that, that change your screen temperature, but it would do it with an overlay because it would you, you'd need root access to actually change the actual screen's temperature otherwise. Right. So it just smeared some red all over and it looked awful. Well, here I was, and I was, I, and it just turns on automatically whenever sunset is. So I'm dumb, and of course, I work on code at night like a human, and um, I decided to record some videos to show my group and show my TA of how development was going. Well, of course, I didn't remember to turn off Twilight, and so all the videos I have of my app when it was working on my phone, they're all red. Oh no! <laughs> you know they say that you know your fondest memories are rose tinted. <laughs> but those I are like, literally um, flux oh, yeah. on my Mac. It when you record the screen, it it does it. Bef- uh, it records it before it gets sent to flux, so it doesn't have the redness in that. So the way but on my iPhone, yeah. I have used a document scanner when I was using Flux, not Night Shift, and it was an app where you took a, the, a photo of some paper or something and it would scan it. And all of those scans had Flux enabled in the photos, and so I had to turn it off and yeah, do it. all those yeah. scans again. Mm-hmm. So the way my screen recorder on Android works is it literally Chromecasts to itself and records the stream incoming. Okay. Uh-huh. So it's 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 casting the entire screen to the TV, which is itself, and then records it. It's terrible, but it works without root. Mm-hmm. Yep. Wow. It's fascinating how some of that stuff works. I know. That actually that actually brings me to something kind of entertaining here uh, that I've been working on recently, which is um, basically general messing around with uh, libav or ffmpeg. Uh, you might recall ffmpeg from uh basically anyone who's ever done any sort of video that was uh, me i did it yeah yeah Yeah. that Uh, was also me when i was a kid trying to clone youtube with ffmpeg oh right oh yeah (laughs) i've been Uh, using it for years to uh convert videos through other apps that use it as a backend pretty much oh how neat yeah 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 yeah. see i have to say I, i had only uh worked with it occasionally but uh, th- over the past couple of weeks, I've been really trying to figure out uh, some of the intricacies of it because uh, of some uh, software-defined radio fun stuff that I've been messing around with, which is kind of fun. Um, you can see an example of that in the show notes. But uh, one of the fun things I'm doing with FFmpeg is um, using it to play an audio file or s- so play audio from a capture device, um, then ping it up to my VPS so that I can access it from wherever I might be, right? But then in order to do that, I have to uh, do something very particular. Um, Perhaps this is silly and you guys will identify for this for me while I explain it. Uh, (laughs) Essentially what I do is I open up an RTP stream. So that's basically, uh, some people refer to that as like multicast. I'm not using it in multicast mode, I'm using it in unicast mode, but um, it basically sends UDP packets to the address, IP address you give it on a certain port. And then on my VPS, I um, capture those U- uh, UDP packets, and I uh, through AVCon, which is the successor to FFmpeg, I convert it to uh, an HTTP live streaming feed, right? Basically a stream, and I uh, serve that from my VPS so that I can access it from my phone. And it is the most hilarious thing in the universe. I wrote a little script to do it, and it's on GitHub. Uh, and it's kind of pretty gross, but it's also pretty entertaining, and it's been a really fun way to kind of mess with that. So even though it can be such a huge headache um, and the options are really kind of obtuse and poorly documented, um, I'd highly recommend checking that out if you are interested in doing anything whatsoever with audio or video. Yeah, it's yeah pretty I cool. think I listened to it for, you know, like five seconds because I was working on my iPad, and it sounded pretty... Uh, 
compressed or or maybe that was your source stream. I don't know. It was it was a little low quality kind of sound. Oh, I tried to listen to it, but it didn't work on Windows. Right. It's or Android. Totally, it's totally low quality. It's uh, absolutely horrific. And that's mostly because of the quality of the capture device. Uh, it's literally like a handheld radio, essentially, but it has a USB port. And you plug it into your computer. That's kind of cool, actually. Tell huh. it to tune into things. The quality is abysmal, as you saw, Brian. Um, but it's really entertaining. It is, like, so entertaining. That's cool. Is it but, still up and running? It isn't up and running now, but uh, I can I can put a link up there because it's just weather radio, right? And I'm not like uh, acting as a repeater for like I don't know KS95 or something. Um, yeah, is that what you listen to? No, oh my gosh, no. <laughs> Go, buddy. I'm a I'm a subs- I'm a sustainer of Minnesota Public Radio. Oh, so okay. don't okay. even. There we don't go. Don't even. Don't at me. I'm not adding um, or evening. <laughs> but um. But because because it's like a government publication, you know, all sorts of people do this. So that's why I'm using it as a test subject because I don't feel uh, like a bad person for kind of trying to mess around with learn, learning stuff with it. So it's pretty cool. Pretty neat. I will get a link up presently. Yeah. If I was trying to play around with the stream and I needed some random stream, I think government weather is probably the first thing I would go to. So, yep. And plus, it's just so fun to listen to. I don't know why. It just is. Well, anyhow, uh, while I'm messing with this, I will describe to you uh, our, well, we'll we'll go to our uh, favorite tried and true segment, which is, who are we following on Twitter this month? (laughs) This month. (laughs) This month. (laughs) Okay. Well, Uh, let's begin with the most prolific Twitter ever. Brandon. So. I uh, cut down this month's 50 new followees to just four. Whoa. Um, <laughs> uh, yes, I uh, definitely do follow a uh, rather large number of people. Uh, this first one is a new arcade that's going up in Minneapolis. It's called Up Down. Oh, Up Down. Oh, that's so cute. Followed. They have, yeah, there are a bunch of cool people who I really. Uh, admire and respect are following and supporting this folk, uh, these folks, including uh, Christina, who goes by Galicia on Twitter, Kevin Winery, who is an awesome and amazing person and founder of uh, JavaScript Minnesota, um, founder Emeritus, or founder at large, uh, Zachary Johnson, who writes about games, and he's from our area, and uh, Anton, whose last name I do not know, but his first name is Anton, who you will find in the uh, data viz and public info slash infosec kind of spaces in the Twin Cities. All of these folks are really awesome folks, uh, and they talk about this thing uh, recently, which is how it came to my attention. Updown has, uh, or is ostensibly going to have this really awesome uh, ga- uh, game called Killer Queen, which I played at Signal. Uh, Killer Queen is totally like unreal. Um, essentially, it's a 10 player arcade game. 10 player um i'll I'll see if i can pull the link uh and it's i I don't even know how to describe it i think you might just have to like look at the website because it is it is like unreal but kevin winery uh the person who i mentioned previously uh introduced me to it and it is uh like way 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 nifty so signal being of course the conference that his company twilio runs yep um which I'm going to in May. Fun Very fact. Nice. It's going to be awesome. Uh, next followee is Making Invisible. Uh, so at Making Invisible. And it is one of my favorite Twitter bots ever. Essentially, it tweets memes, uh, but it, it all the memes take the phrase making the blank blank. So like making the uninformative informative, making the uh, unglamorous glamorous. I love it. And sometimes sometimes it gets really weird. Like making the indistinguishable distinguishable, <laughs> or um, making the uh, infinitesimal finitesimal, right? Which is just like. <laughs> but uh, I love awesome. how irrelevant the photographs yeah. behind them are. Oh, totally! Like making the incremental incremental, and it's just like a ring with a mirror on it. It's yeah, I I love this bot. It's amazing, and if you're not it's following, hilarious. you are missing out. Uh, next up is an amazing person and academic whose name is Ian Bogost. Uh, yes. Ryan and I uh, 
have both uh, read books uh, or segments of books and writings and seen him say words, presumably. I've seen him say words at least on a couple of panels and uh, interviews. He is a huge person in the era uh, area of um, like game research yep. and um, the significance of like technology in a kind of rhetorical space. Uh, though he's not uh, a rhetorician, that's kind of where I see him um, because I'm taking a class on rhetoric technology on the internet. Uh, and he's just a really awesome person to follow on Twitter. He is full of puns, and uh, his work is really cool if you haven't seen it before. You should see it and breathe it and live it. It's good stuff. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And finally, you know, I wasn't sure if I was going to put this one in here. Uh, I'm not really sure who this person is, but I followed him. No, just kidding. It is uh, my fellow co-host, co Brian Mitchell. He has a new Twitter handle, and it is at underscore Brian Mitchell underscore. Yay! Yeah, I should have. I, thought... I should have. Let... What me? Okay. I should have let, uh, <laughs> should have let uh, you yes, introduce yes. it, Brian. But you should go for it. I um, so Tech Four Seven Eight Nine came out of B Man Four Seven Eight Nine with a focus on tech, and so like it kind of described it if you knew where it came from, but on its own was pretty random and not very descriptive of who I am at all. So. Uh, I went with Brian Mitchell under, or underscore Brian Mitchell underscore. And they're really, so Twitter usernames have to be 15 characters or less. And Brian Mitchell is 13. So that gives me two characters to work with. If I want my entire name in there. So we were talking about in the fringe, which you totally listened to um, what two character uh, core util commands I could put before or after my name. But then I ended up with just going underscore on each end because it's a little cleaner. Although, I'm not the hugest fan of underscores, but I'll, I'll take it because I think it's better than what I had. Yeah, that, that game is always really tricky to f figure out a, uh, a, a username that works for you. Yep. I, I hopped on the Brandon underscore MN train uh, early enough that it wasn't too big of a problem. But if I would have waited any longer, all the good ones with my name are taken. <laughs> Yeah, I, I was lucky enough to get into the Twitter before all the names got taken, so here I am. I don't know what I was thinking when I made my B Man four seventy nine account in July of two thousand nine, because there were so many more open. Yeah. <sighs> no well, worries, you know, no when um, when Twitter dot com closes because they screw up something terrible and everybody leaves and we all go back to app dot net, you can get a new name. I I totally can. <laughs> <laughs> app dot net, here we come win so brian who did you follow on twitter recently um well i'll just start off and say i unfollowed probably about 30 accounts yesterday um i just noticed a bunch of i just had a lot of a lot more tweets than i remember re having to read every day i don't know a year ago or something but most of the accounts i unfollowed were stale uh like jailbreak tweak accounts some app store app accounts so not really many people who tweet very often, but still, my following count is now down to 256. I think it was nice. in that high 280s. Anyway, um, I followed Karen, who goes by Angel X Wind. She's a uh, long time, well known jailbreak tweet developer. Now, I will say, I haven't been in that jailbreak community for a year. I, la well, a little less than a year. Last jailbreak with iOS 8.4. Haven't jailbroke anything since, and I probably won't at all in the future. But it's fun to see what they're doing in the community still. Mm. I also followed Commit Strip as a good feed to get new comics from Commit Strip. Good development uh, web comics, I guess. And then I followed Oh My Z Shell or Oh My Zish on Twitter just to keep following things that I use. Very good. Nice. What about you, Ryan? Oh man, I uh, you know I don't I don't use Twitter like you people. I don't follow every person under the sun. Uh, so I followed a person called Fiera Eterna, I believe is how you might say it. Uh, anytime I see a person talking about compilers or assembly or compilers or assembly, I follow them. Pretty much, I, I'm feeling like this person might have mentioned Haskell or Rust or Go or something, and somehow I found them. So, I followed yeah. her for a month or two. I feel like I don't remember how I found her account. Did Brandon mention her? No. It's possible. Uh, I 
she's definitely a, a mutual mutual follow. Um, and I know uh, they do a lot of compiler stuff, and it's really uh, definitely one of my favorite uh, feeds too. So it's incidentally, Syracuse follows her. And yeah. uh, she's a friend, uh, probably, of Melissa and or uh, A Bad Idea. So that's yeah. probably how I found them through some suggestion box. Yeah. Yep. So that's pretty cool. Let's see. Who else do we have here? We have Fichette Barbara. Now, this is a cool one. This is actually my grandmother. And somehow <laughs> she signed up for Twitter a couple of weeks ago on February 14th. And <laughs> so, oh, um, so here's the story. Here's the deal. Uh, she used to have cable, but she got rid of cable because it was really expensive from Comcast. It was like $160. Ridiculous. And so uh-huh. she really, really, really wanted to watch her favorite nighttime TV, which is the Republican debates with Donald Trump. Oh, and, no. <laughs> and so she, she needed to get into what is known as Periscope. And Periscope is apparently owned by Twitter, and Twitter yep. makes you sort of kind of use Twitter to log in. And so she signed up to Twitter. Now, apparently <laughs> she mistyped her name. Instead of Barbara J. Fisher, she typed in a T, and so it's Fischette. So, <laughs> I, I have tweeted at Bra- Barbara J. Barbara Fischette or Fischette Barbara a few times, and it's kind of fun. So, if you're ever bored and you need somebody to tweet to, she might actually respond. She's responded to me against all odds quite a few times over the last few weeks. <laughs> so, it's kind of cool. That's nice. Um, yeah, so, uh, so use Twitter more, grandmother. It's a lot of fun. Also, you, on her profile picture, you can see her cute cat, which is very cute. Totally. So let's see. I, uh, when, just, just now when you're talking about Updown Minneapolis, I, I realized, wouldn't it be cool if, if Updown had a Twitter account? <laughs> and yeah. I was about to go make one, but it turns out I did in 2010. So if anybody is super bored, you can also follow If Updown. On Twitter, I'm so <laughs> there. I, I I can't believe it exists. I had no idea. I I don't even I don't think I can even log into it. It's been so long. Okay, and finally, I followed another guy, and I know I never do this. I followed underscore Brian Mitchell underscore. Can you believe this? I'm I'm so happy and impressed with you, Ryan. Yep. <laughs> it's the scandal of the century. It really what? is. <laughs> Now you should also mention me. that you made a uh, what Max is calling a tweet three hundred two redirect uh, for yes. for this account. I made a sixth Twitter account, which is just parking tech four seventy nine. In case I don't know if someone look, goes there and mentions that, I'll get a notification and <laughs> say you're looking for this. So now I want to put one more thing that isn't a Twitter thing in. I want to put in a different thing. So for work, they wanted me to make a new GitHub account. So now you can also follow me on my new GitHub account, which is Rhinomar dash Dowerty. And that's kind of fun because it's literally my regular account, but with some more stuff in it. <laughs> nice. And that that's, that's a picture of me at work. So now you know I was actually there and I'm not making it all up. <laughs> wink, wink. It's real. Yep, it's real. Yep, so there I- you go. I will also note, just briefly, I did finally follow Swift on security this week. Oh, there you go. Nice. And I I switched from following Elon Musk on my personal account to my tech account. Yeah, because you're all about that Tesla 3. I'm, I kind of wish I'd put a down payment on one because it's going to come out in a couple of years, but I know I really probably shouldn't. So well, so how, much, how much is the down payment? Like, like That's got to be a ton, right? $1,000. Oh, that's not and bad. Then, the car starts at thirty five, but um, you know it can get more expensive yeah. as you add more features. Mm-hmm. And I think they're at two hundred fifty two thousand pre orders now. Yep, that's as what of I heard a few hours ago. Mm-hmm. Wow. And a day ago or something, Musk said that each car averaged forty two thousand dollars per so order. My friend which, um, Kenny Lee, who was in my app development group, he actually did the pre order thing, and he's in the list. I think he got in at one hundred fifty two thousand. So okay. Hopefully he'll get wow. one. <laughs> so if you do the math at the still forty two thousand dollar average times two hundred fifty thousand, Tesla is going to come in with ten point five eight billion dollars of Model Threes. That's amazing. 
That is unbelievable. Now, and but... it's and it's not like you know these cars are. Um, no, it's not like any other manufacturer couldn't make something similar to this. It's just because nobody else is. Yeah. Well, I mean, like the Nissan Leaf exists, but I think Tesla has totally won over in terms of, I guess, public opinion. Well, it's it's also that, but it's also marketing. Uh, you know, you trust Tesla, and yeah. And their cars are quite different. They're just the whole, the whole, I guess, display kind of thing. Mm -hmm. They're they look nice. They're taking more of a jump. I think they're not as cautious because they know they'll have support for whatever they do. Yep. So and I don't know if you guys have ever driven in a Nissan Leaf uh, or a Nissan. Um, they have they have like a similar one that's gas powered, but it looks almost exactly the same. Um, and um, apologies to anyone who owns a car, one of these cars, but they're just like I I couldn't stand it. Mm -hmm. I, the, t the Tesla, from an industrial design perspective, is much more feels more like a car and less like I'm, um, like um, shall we say, packed into the uh, back seat uh, of uh, uh, you know one of those like really horrible air airline configurations. Oh right? yeah, mm -hmm. uh, even when you're in the front seat. But you didn't hear that from me. Well, you um, know, I think that that's a case of uh, them trying a design and sticking with it for too long and not pouring way more money into it. Right, right. Yeah. And I mean, for for those of you who might be fans of Top Gear, um, you'll know that a lot of Tesla's designs are kind of copped from uh, the Lotus. Um, I think the Lotus Esprit is the is the basis of the Tesla. Uh, of the Roadster, at least it was. And the I Roadster believe... was a Mercedes design, completely. I think. Really. Maybe it was Mercedes, but yeah, like the the design of the car was more or less purchased by Tesla, and then Tesla designed the Model S and the Model Three and the Model X. Mm -hmm. Well, you're gonna have yeah. to check us out I'm... on our new car show. Right. <laughs> Pretty much. Uh, yeah. Car Ooh. kit, or no? It can't be car kit. That's already a thing, isn't it? <laughs> Yeah, it's an actual yeah. framework. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll 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 do that. We'll, we'll uh, sort out the names for that. Auto uh, kit. Later. I don't know. Uh, auto kit. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, but that would actually be fun. We should we should do that. We should maybe we should call it neutral. Oh no, no, we couldn't <laughs> possibly. Uh, what? <laughs> Are you sure you didn't just play a sound clip? It uh, sounds perfect. I mean, it really does. Maybe. I, I might have just played a sound clip there. I don't know. <laughs> Nobody so, else is going to get it. Yeah, right. Pretty much. Well, you know. <laughs> I bet all of our so listeners will get it. You on the last one of them. Well, this has been a great show. Uh, it's been good. It has been. It's, it's good to uh, come together again after a month. Definitely. Yeah. We'll see. I, uh, I am next weekend, I'm going to Northfield to go to Carl Hacks. Okay. What? Hackathon. That's pretty neat. So I will have one heck of a weekend next weekend, and I will probably be tweeting about it the whole time. That sounds good. So. Tweeting is good. Fave and RT left and right. Excellent. I think, and now remember, I those likes will... don't mean nothing now. <laughs> Worthless. <laughs> Never gonna live that down. Hey, <laughs> at, at least it's uh, at least it's more reliable than uh, Bitcoin, right? Oh. <laughs> But I think I'll be working on uh, HeyGetBackToYou.Work again. That nice. might be a nice. Nice project. Very good. What do you think you're going to do with it? That's a good question. I put three issues on the GitHub page. Mostly um, kill that crap background that doesn't work on mobile very well. Mm -hmm. uh, fix up how styling works and just make a ton more content. And crazy, somewhat hacky, but functional JavaScript to do crazy things, I think. Nice. Oh, that sounds good. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, I'm, let's see. So JavaScript Minnesota was last week, so I don't have anything fun necessarily in those regards to do this week. Um, otherwise, it's just lots and lots of work. Work in class, class and work. Yeah, me too. I'm going to work. <laughs> nice. Uh, but I am also working on sort of a something else on the side. Um, it's a little thing I wanted to make. It's... Um, Basically, what I wanted to do is whenever I tweet a, a tweet with a link, one link, and I tweet it, 
I want the my little service here to go out, fetch my tweet, and tweet, fetch my link, and then sort of like give me a little space to write about it on its own system, and then save it there and make it look pretty. That is neat. So you, you're you're making a, a daring fireball. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh huh. Yeah, but you based got, on the Twitter. Feed. Yeah, based on my own Twitter field. So we'll see how it works. Uh, I'm not too far into it yet, but I'm going to get in there. Nice. Mm. Um, Super cool. Mm-hmm. So where can we find you on the internet? Well, you can find me just about everywhere, but especially on the Twitter at Randomar, and of course at my office, which is in uh, Bloomington. So come and visit. Well, you can find me on Twitter at Brandon underscore MN uh, or on GitHub uh, where I am uh, Bramper Sandin. If that you is don't know how to spell that, absolutely can, ridiculous. Yeah, if you don't know how to spell that, you can just go to brandon.mn, my website, where uh, I have links to all of those things. Um, and that is about the best place you can find me. Otherwise, you can find me hanging out uh, in the real world uh, at Gold Medal Park, which is uh, right over by the Guthrie there, where I uh, sometimes buy lattes from a really awesome coffee stand that hangs out right about there. And nice. will, believe it or not, be uh, doing so with friend of the show, Max Fierke, uh yes. this week, hopefully. Very good. And we may or may not be recording an impromptu episode of Brain and is enthusiastic about things. Woohoo! Ooh. Yeah. Let's go to it. How about you? Well, you can find me on Twitter at bman4789 if you care about more what I'm doing that's not tech related, or at uh, underscore sandwich Brian Mitchell. That is underscore Brian Mitchell underscore. Oh, okay, I get it. Sandwiches, yes, right. Should I be my tagline? Brian underscore sandwich. No, wait. Underscore sandwich, Brian Mitchell. I don't know if we want to get too specific. (laughs) So, good, good show, everyone. Yep, thanks for coming. Absolutely. See you next time. Have a good one. Mm -hmm.